Well, Bill, thank you so much for hosting me. Amy, thank you for the invitation. Thanks to all of you for making the time for the conversation. Um, I'm grateful to see so many people interested in this topic at, at this time. Um, you've set a high standard. You've said the book is important. Well, we'll see. Um, we'll, and we'll see how provocative I am. <laughs> it certainly provokes, no doubt about that. Um, uh, I, I came out of graduate school with a master's degree. As, as Bill indicated, I, I did my doctorate a little later in my career. I st started in this field with a master's degree. I had the option of coming here, but as a California kid, I decided I wanted to go somewhere further afield to do international things, so I went to the London School of Economics. Uh, I came out of that master's program 1981 uh, at the height of NATO's deep debate about nuclear force modernization. Uh, the alliance was trying to redress the imbalance in nuclear forces in Europe, resulting from a large Soviet buildup, uh, and there were these two just diametrically opposed camps. On the one hand, the nuclear freeze movement, um, and on the other hand, uh, build and build and build and then build some more. Uh, and uh, I did the only sane thing uh, a master's graduate could do, which was flee. <laughs> um, I watched uh, the program I was in, had 28 uh, graduates, um, 19 of them American, uh, 18 of those 19 worked the NATO nuclear policy issue, or tried to. It was the hot, interesting topic, and I was um, re repelled by the, the just the, the fundamentally diametrically opposed views, and it's, it seemed that there was no, no way really to make a contribution that was going to shift something in some direction. So I went off and worked uh, chemical and biological weapons issues for a long time. Uh, missile proliferation, and really only began to get dragged into the nuclear policy de debate, which is exactly how I saw it, uh, in, in the, the, the late Saddam years, so to speak, when we really began to come to terms with what it might mean to have to deter and perhaps fight through and defeat uh, a regional power potentially actually willing to employ nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction to support his military objectives and political objectives. Uh, and uh, what happened in the nuclear policy debate through that period, the 1990s and into the 2000s, was the, the middle essentially disappeared, as it has in so much of the rest of American political life. Uh, and, and these two camps remain in, in largely diametrically opposed worldviews. Uh, it's not fair to say that there's a debate between these two opposing camps. They, they rarely debate. Uh, and um, they have different assumptions about the way the world works, different <coughs> fundamental priorities, uh, and the like. That was all fine and dandy for, for a couple of decades, because it really didn't matter. There was no important nuclear business, nuclear policy business, for the nation to do. Uh, from, from the perspective of our arms control strategies, our political strategies to try to reduce threats, well, after 1995, the NPT was indefinitely extended. Uh, START 1 was in place with its verification provisions, and the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, could talk about moving away from arms control, but the fact was it was in place until 2011, 2010. Uh, and on the nuclear forces side of the equation, there, we, we haven't had to spend a penny. Um, we spent uh, about 20% of the defense budget through the Cold War on nuclear forces, uh, and since 1990, we've spent about 2% to simply maintain and operate the forces we have. Uh, and this period of coasting has come to an end. And now it matters that we have a, a non-debate between two polar opposite camps um, because in the absence of finding some points of convergence, uh, we're not going to have further arms control measures supported by the Senate, and we're not going to have nuclear forces. Uh, that seems like a big, bald statement, but let me illustrate it with a couple of facts. Uh, the newest um, ICBM in the ground today, in service today, went into the ground in 1971. 
Uh, the newest B-52 flying in a nuclear, nuclear mission today, uh, the newest, first flew in 1962. The newest nuclear weapon went into the arsenal in 1989. Its design life was 25 years. That's the newest. Um, you apply all of these lifetime, lifetime curves out on a, on a timeline, and they're just waterfall after waterfall coming over the next 15 years. Things will just age out and retire. So some effort needed to be made to address this, this place that we are in. Uh, an initial effort was made by the Congress in 2007. Uh, the Congress chartered the new administration, then, of course, not clear who that would be, but chartered the new administration to do a nuclear posture review. Uh, and at the same time, on the, actually the same piece of paper in the law, uh, the Congress said, we the Congress need to get smarter about this topic. Uh, we'll create a Congressional Advisory Commission, bipartisan in character, uh, which was then chaired by Bill Perry and Vice Chairman Jim Schlesinger. And that, they were asked a simple question. Is there anything you guys can agree about? <laughs> uh, and it was almost that bald, and the, almost, the answer was almost no. Uh, and at the end of the day, the, the commission said, uh, the tradition of American nuclear strategy makes sense. It has to be balanced in the sense that we want to use political measures to reduce nuclear dangers, arms control, disarmament, nonproliferation, um, but so long as dangers remain to have military means to deter the threats to us and our allies. <coughs> the balanced approach. Well, my, my big question is, where is the balanced approach going? Um, the stewards of it have disappeared again. Uh, Jim Schlesinger died. Um, Bill Perry has packed <coughs> off in a different direction. And the rest of the commission really didn't have the political weight to get things done. So uh, what I thought I, I would do in this book is to look at the history of the U.S. <coughs> efforts since the end of the Cold War, and particularly but not exclusively in the Obama administration, <clears throat> to further reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons in U.S. security strategy and to create the conditions that would allow others to join us in this process, other nuclear armed states. Uh, and at the same time, to look at the experience of three or four presidential administrations in trying to adapt deterrence to new purposes, new challenges after the Cold War, and to assess the lessons of that for... Uh, where we can go next on nuclear dis disarmament and de-emphasis. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the book goes through a, a series of chapters uh, examining the experience of both the nation and then the Obama administration and working uh, the new set of problems. The place most people start this discussion is with Russia today, of course. That's not where I start the discussion. I uh, start the discussion with North Korea uh, and, and Iraq and Iran a little bit. But, but the problem, that, the new strategic problem that first came America's way after the Cold War, which is not major powers with nuclear weapons, but regional powers with nuclear weapons, and not many of them, but a few, uh, and apparently committed to the proposition that if they can make the American homeland vulnerable to nuclear attack, we're not going to come knocking on their door. Uh, and you, uh, you can trace the evolution of Iraqi thinking about the role of WMD in deterring and defeating a U.S.-led uh, coalition of the willing, uh, and I do some of that, but I elaborate more fully uh, the thinking of North Korea uh, and what, what I call the, uh, the new Austin, Texas problem. Uh, and if you, you may remember uh, that, that a couple of years ago we flew some B-52 bombers through South Korean airspace, but as a display of nuclear commitment, largely a display to the South, intended to assure. Uh, and North Korea responded with two propaganda pieces of its own. One was a, a video of a young man dreaming of being called to do the nuclear bombing on Manhattan. Uh, uh, and then the other was a photograph of Kim Jong-un taking his nuclear planning briefing in front of a, a giant wall chart of North Korean ICBMs coming in and striking American cities. 
and the one that was most visible on the map right behind his head was Austin, Texas. I mean, this was clearly intended to create for us an image of uh, America held hostage uh, and thus um, unwilling to act to defend its interests and those of its allies. Um, this experience with North Korea has reintroduced some Cold War vocabulary and concepts to our strategic dialogue, particularly our dialogue with these allies. The vocabulary of decoupling, uh, where, which was uh, really a 19, early 1960s vintage discussion about could the Soviets succeed in get, getting the United States not to defend its NATO allies uh, by threatening the homeland. And the other vocabulary, the, ins the stability, instability paradox. Uh, and if you haven't come across this idea yet, it's just basically that um, how, how did we explain that the more confident the Soviet Union got in its nuclear forces, it also seemed to become more assertive at the conventional level? Uh, does that explain what's going on in South Asia? Does that explain what's going on in uh, North Korean policy today, that it's making these provocations at the conventional level because of its confidence in its emerging nuclear deterrent. Um, but from the narrow perspective of the topic of the book, recall the proposition, one of the propositions of the Global Zero Movement is that the moment is ripe for a strong international co coalition of nuclear armed states to join together in their commitment to reducing nuclear dangers and moving directly to um, bold steps to disarmament. Hard to see North Korea signed up to that proposition. Right? Uh, on Russia, um, this is an old story. Uh, uh, and if, you, if, you're, if you're fans of this topic, I recommend Angela Stent's book to you. Um, what's the, but I always get the name wrong, Nikolai. Do you remember the name of that? This is... Uh, it's the his, she's a professor of Russian studies at Georgetown University, uh, and uh, two months before Russia's invasion or uh, I'm sorry annexation of Crimea, um, she came out with a book entitled something like U.S. Russia relations since the Cold War, but looking at the history of what she calls four resets, three by the United States, one by Putin, and her punchline is. This is the relationship we're going to have. It's not going to be reset and fundamentally different. Uh, it's going to be difficult and contentious. Mr. Putin has put his own imprint on things, um, but we're not likely to see after Mr. Putin somebody <coughs> fundamentally like Mr. Yeltsin. Um, and this is the this is the status quo, uh, and this is a revisionist power. Uh, if you have most people who have followed Russian politics will remember his, Putin's speech to his parliament uh, defending, explaining, uh, and announcing the military, uh, the annexation of Crimea. But they don't remember the content of the speech, which was about why. Uh, and the world order, uh, and, and essentially Putin saying at the end of 12 years of trying to engage the West, in pursuing what we could think of as cooperative interests, I've had my hand slapped just enough. Uh, and the world order that America prefers is not a world order that's in Russia's interest, and the European security order that, that America defends is not only unjust, but unstable and dangerous to Russia. Uh, and like a spring compressed too long, we need to snap back hard. Pretty, pretty clear statement. Um, uh, the book goes on, it, it, it picks up a theme I introduced in the North Korea chapter, um, which I'll come back to. Uh, let me work, save that thought for uh, a later moment. The Obama administration came in and put an emphasis in Russia policy on reset, of course, uh, but also on um, strategic stability and strategic assurance. Uh, in our missile defense policy, we offered some very clear assurances to Moscow and a willingness to uh, engage in confidence and security building measures, indeed more than a willingness, uh, a list. Um, Russia proved unreceptive to these assurances uh, and 
it, it appears that the whole missile defense narrative, by that point in Russian internal thinking, had become about something entirely different, not about missile defense, but about this unjust European security order that needed to be pushed, snapped back against hard. Um, on strategic stability, uh, we, the Obama administration, thought that we were laying the foundations for, we thought that New START would be kind of a bridge, uh, that, that it was what you needed to put in place because Old START was going to fade off, expire, before we had done all of our intellectual homework and political homework with Russia to define the appropriate and appropriately bold follow-on to START one. Well, New START proved much more difficult to negotiate than we expected, uh, and uh, difficult, although expectedly difficult, for the Senate to ratify. Uh, and it quickly became clear that the strategic stability dialogue we envisioned with the Russians became simply a vehicle for their harangue about all of their complaints, about all of the developments in U.S. strategic policy to which they objected uh, and see as uh, uh, if you know the old children's game about the leg bone being connected to the hip bone and the knee bone and all of that, that's, that became Russia's vision of strategic stability. Everything's connected to everything. Uh, and America is at the core of the instability. Uh, and this was, of course, not a view shared by the Obama administration. So uh, at, at the very least, we said um, that with Russia, we, we, we believed in the possibility of laying, taking an additional bilateral arms reduction of an additional one-third of the deployed strategic offensive weapons to go roughly from 1,550 to 1,000. But we could do that only if Russia were willing to do that with us. Uh, and on, this, on a simple logic, some of their weapons exist for the sole purpose of targeting some of our weapons. Some of our weapons exist for the sole purpose of targeting some of their weapons. You can whittle down the stockpiles and not in any way change the basic relationship of mutual vulnerability. Russia's been unwilling to do that. Uh, and so a second key part of creating the conditions to allow the Obama administration and others later to further reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons in U.S. strategy has, ha hasn't been possible, hasn't been met in, in this dimension. What about China? Well, you... Uh, to invoke the shorthand from the George W. Bush administration, in the case of Russia, what they were trying to do was to move nuclear weapons out of the foreground and put them in the background. A, a good graphic image, which the Russians, of course, objected to because that sounded like you're demeaning us. Um, in the U.S.-China relationship, it's basically the, the reverse problem. What we've been trying to do is keep nuclear weapons in the background keep them from moving into the foreground, keep the nuclear relationship from becoming more competitive and more corrosive of our political uh, agenda for cooperation. Um, here, too, the Obama administration proposed a strategic stability dialogue. Uh, connoisseurs of the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review report know that we mentioned, uh, we praised the virtues of strategic stability with Russia and China, in the, in the same sentence, 38 times. Um, we, this was a message to China that we were taking this strategic military relationship seriously. We were committed to a principle of balance. We did not say what the Chinese wanted to hear, which is that we, the United States, accept mutual vulnerability as the basis of the strategic relationship. We did, in the missile defense review, say missile defense is not about China when it comes to the defense of the American homeland, um, but it is about China when it comes to the defense of our forces in the Asia-Pacific and our allies there as well. Uh, a mixed message, and China only heard the part they most didn't like, of course. Um, we, we had privately the ambition that, it, that out of a dialogue on strategic stability with China, we would discover a lot of common interests in strategic stability. You know, wor worried about the potential for miscalculation in cyberspace, worried about emerging dangerous competition in outer space, <clears throat> and not wanting to end up in a place where China's lack of transparency about its 
nuclear modernization program became an impetus to new nuclear weapons in America's policy. What was China's response to this interest? No, thank you. Dialogue on strategic stability? No, thank you. And we have to say that after, uh, so that the Clinton administration had a commitment at the summit level to a nuclear dialogue with China, which China didn't make good on. The George W. Bush administration had a commitment to nuclear dialogue uh, with the president of China, a different president, a different time, uh, the same result. So after 25 years of experience, you have to ask yourself, um, is China ever going to want to have with us the kind of nuclear relationship we would call sort of normal for the situation? And are they and Russia capable of receiving the assurances we want to offer them? Because the primary focus of American strategic policy until the last couple of years has been on ensuring that our strategic posture is credible in denying leverage to rogue states with WMD. I mean, Obama administration didn't use the word rogue states, but the focus of the United States hasn't been on fixing some nuclear problem with Russia or fixing some nuclear problem with China. It's about making sure that North Korea, Iran, and Iraq aren't able to coerce us out of doing our security duties in these regions. Uh, and that isn't the message that Beijing and Moscow took for different reasons. And the assurances the United States has tried to offer them have fallen on largely deaf ears. And you can bet that the next president and the next administration is going to try, try, try again. And we should keep trying again, but we should, under, we should, set our, we should have realistic expectations about what this is going to produce. So we, we thought that maybe at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the Chinese might be willing to say what both Washington and Moscow need to hear to take an additional one-third reduction in nuclear weapons. China has to say, we're going to cap here. Maybe not forever, maybe not lock set in some legally binding framework, but just say, you know, we, we think we're going to have enough when we get to this. China's not willing to say that. So... What are the conditions that might allow China to join the process of reducing the role and number of nuclear weapons? From China's perspective, the answer is pretty close to there are no conditions in today's world. Uh, I then go on to look um, at, a, at extended deterrence in both in separate chapters in Europe and East Asia. Um, uh, the talk I had the pleasure of giving here two years ago was about uh, a theme in this work, which is um, that from the perspective of American nuclear strategy, the main problem today isn't in the central strategic balance with Russia. The main problem today is in our extended deterrence relationships in Europe and, and Northeast Asia, an area where we sort of have gone to sleep in the sense that uh, at the end of the Cold War, all nuclear weapons in Asia all U.S. nuclear weapons were brought home uh, and destroyed. Uh, and um, from now it's the case that from Europe we've withdrawn 97% of what were there at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and this rough, this simple quantitative metric is a rough indicator of the amount of intellectual investment that went into these topics in the intervening period. Extended deterrence and nuclear deterrence in Northeast Asia, who needs to think about that? Was the, you couldn't find any reference to that topic in either of the, nu, the, of the nuclear posture reviews done in 1994 or 2001. Obama administration put a lot of emphasis on, East a, on Asian factors in our nuclear policy development. Uh, that was sort of a novelty. Uh, and so... Uh, I, I examine the experience in Northeast Asia of working with the Japanese and South Koreans. Uh, with our NATO allies, we have a, an easy mechanism for dialogue on <coughs> these topics, which is the NATO high-level group, uh, a long-standing body within NATO uh, that works right below the level of the defense ministers and reports to them. Um, and the NATO nuclear planning group, the NATO high-level group, 
uh, was very active uh, in the four years, five years, six years after the Obama administration's nuclear posture review uh, as it conducted a deterrence and defense policy review, as NATO did. Um, we discovered, uh, well, I should back up one step. In the course of conducting the nuclear posture review, we began with extensive international <coughs> consultations. Uh, that hadn't been done in 2001 or 1994. Uh, it was my pleasure to conduct about 80 consultations with about 30 different allies. Um, uh, our uh, NATO allies were uh, eager. Uh, our Japanese and South Korean allies were more eager. Uh, and, uh, we, the Obama administration, said, now the future of U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe, this will be a NATO decision. Uh, and, you know, there, were, there was lots of public commentary in 2009 and 10 that the Prague vision would and should lead to the withdrawal of remaining U.S. nuclear weapons from Europe, and that this is what NATO publics wanted uh, and what NATO leaders wanted. Turns out the public commentary was 180 degrees off where NATO leaders were. Uh, by 2010, it was already quite clear to NATO leaders that the effort to engage Russia in cooperative endeavor, endeavors in Europe uh, on renewing the conventional arms control regime, on ballistic missile defense transparency, and a variety of other topics were going nowhere. In fact, they were getting thrown back in the alliance's face. Uh, and already by 2010 and 2011, it was clear that the security environment to NATO south was getting worse as well. Uh, so NATO leaders proved unwilling to jettison those last 3% of U.S. non-strategic nuclear weapons in Europe. This came as a big political surprise to a lot of people. And there was an odd mismatch between the NGO community that was very heavily focused on their expectation that the last weapons were coming out and the underlying political reality at NATO, which was in a very different direction. And there's something parallel at work in Northeast Asia, where a lot of the public commentary, I mean, you can, you can imagine, there aren't a lot of op-eds in Japan in favor of uh, US nuclear weapons, for a big, obvious historical reason. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, our Japanese and South Korean allies were uh, anxious extremely so, about the ability and intention of the United States to re-extend nuclear deterrence on their behalf. Now we said, what do you re, re-extend? You know, we've got our nuclear triad, we've got 1,550 nuclear weapons, we've got, we can employ a nuclear weapon anywhere in the world in 30 minutes on behalf of an ally. No, 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 they said. The authors of the 94 and 2001 nuclear posture reviews came along to us and said, Yes, we've taken all these nuclear weapons out of East Asia, but we're keeping a few nuclear cruise missiles for you, Team Lam M. Uh, and those are what we will re redeploy in time of crisis in your defense. And uh, their question was, so, 2009 nuclear posture review guys and gals, um, what are you going to do? And uh, are, does the United States have the intention and capability to, to extend nuclear deterrence on behalf of its allies? Uh, and what are you going to do on the road to Prague? Give up the rest of, what, of the, the tools with which you might do that? And we faced uh, two expensive decisions about modernizing the forces deployed in Europe and modernizing the Tomahawk cruise missile, uh, a gigantic expense. And we ended up saying we'll modernize the dual-capable aircraft and commit to making them globally available in support of allies, which was uh, acceptable to the Northeast Asian allies. So from an extended deterrence perspective, are we in a moment where we can confidently say we can further reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons in the U.S. security strategy safely? Difficult to see that that condition exists. So. Um, the, what this tells me uh, is, is uh, that the, the conditions don't exist 
uh, today to uh, take additional substantial steps to reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons in our security strategy. We have plucked all the low-hanging fruit off the Cold War legacy. Uh, and for us to do to continue to reduce the role and number, our only option to do that at this time appears to be to do it unilaterally. Uh, and um, I don't see, and there, there are two or three big ideas about what to do unilaterally. One is to just uh, close the rest of the nuclear umbrella, um, bring, bring those nuclear weapons home, uh, and tell our allies that even though they might not like it, we're going to extend nuclear deterrence with the triad, and that ought to be good enough. Um, I think that's the wrong message to allies to whom we have said we will make this decision together with you, and they've made it clear what their interest is. Uh, another unilateral measure is to uh, retire one of the legs of the triad, to move to a dyad. Um, um, and the argument is generally made that that would put pressure on Mr. Putin to do the same. I don't read Mr. Putin as a man who would likely to be responsive to that pressure. Uh, on the contrary, I think he would take it as a sign of appeasement, uh, and it would invite uh, additional challenges to uh, our interests. So I don't see, I mean, there might be little things to do, but not big things to do unilaterally. So having answered the question that it, for myself, that I don't think it's the right time to, it, this still doesn't really an answer the question of, well, what are our weapons good for? I mean, why do we have them? Just because the other guy has them? I mean, this is like the Wild West. You can't put down your six-shooter before the other guy puts down the six-shooter. What, what is the role of nuclear weapons in our security strategy today? Uh, and and uh, this is the second main argument in the book. If the first is the conditions do not exist today that will that allow us to confidently take additional <coughs> steps to reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons in our security strategy, the second main argument relates to their role in our security strategy. Uh, and from my perspective, the role begins not with our nuclear strategy, not with our deterrent strategy, not with our military strategy, but with our national strategy. What kind of country do we want to be? And we've repeatedly answered that question since the end of the Cold War in, in rel relatively consistent ways. We want to be an international guarantor. We want to be a credible defender of the interests of our allies. We want to stand for the right thing. We want to project power abroad so that the wars we fight are wars we fight over there instead of on the streets of Monterey. Um, we have a certain, I said we want to do the right thing. We have a certain vision of ourselves as standing up to bad guys. Um, all of these things are the context in which you answer the question of why do we have nuclear weapons today. Uh, but at a more specific level, uh, we've said that the role of nuclear weapons, we've said what, what is almost obvious, that the role of nuclear weapons, the fundamental role of, a, of our nuclear weapons is to deter a nuclear attack. It's not the sole purpose, but it's the fundamental purpose. And we can only imagine using them in very extreme circumstances when our vital interests or those of an ally are at risk. Well, what, what might create that condition? What, what are the conditions that, will, that would put us in a place where we're responding to nuclear use? Well, there are really only three countries that uh, might put us in that position. And I think they've each been thinking, not only do I think, they've said very explicitly uh, that they've been thinking about the problem, the strategic problem they face, uh, which is deterring and defeating a conventionally superior, nuclear-armed major power and its allies. That, I, that formulation is used I, identically by Chinese military writers and Russian military writers. Uh, the Chinese, in my view, came to this problem first, uh, which is to say uh, the um, Persian Gulf War was a wake-up call for them that after the Cold War, America was going to be projecting power military power abroad with some fancy new means that they didn't exactly get. And the Taiwan Missile Crisis of 1995 or 6, 6, thank you, 
brought home to them what we re we remember maybe that we dispatched a carrier battle group. What they remember is that there was a second carrier battle group dispatched, which was the signal of, okay, America's not just showing the flag. This could actually turn up into a shooting war. And if we have to take seriously the problem of war with America, what does that mean? And you can trace through their writings in that period uh, the development of a set of ideas about how to deter and defeat a conventionally superior nuclear armed major power and its allies. Um, Kosovo provided the same impetus to the Russian military leadership. Not at that point the Russian political leadership, um, but you can see beginning in the late 1990s, <laughs> mid, mid to late 1990s, the evolution of actually quite similar concepts to those of the Chinese. Uh, and then later endorsed by political leadership in Russia. Uh, and I think the third in the list is uh, North Korea which uh, by, by, by press reports in 2006 gained access <coughs> to the classified war plan for the defense of South Korea, uh, which by press reporting indicates that uh, regime removal was a possible war objective of the U.S. ROK alliance. Well, better get your house in order. Uh, and, and you began to see Real, real, not just propaganda writing, but real, real writing uh, out of North Korean resources uh, and um, the development of a similar set of concepts. The concepts, if you face the problem of deterring and defeating a conventionally superior nuclear armed major power, the concepts are, you know, sort of common, which is if you got a problem coming, you better act really quickly to create a fait accompli before America can create the coalition of the willing, bring its allies to bear, get its forces in the region. If you fail to create the fait accompli, if the Russian military is not successful in gaining the control of three Baltic capitals in 66 hours, uh, if the fait accompli fails, then they have to satisfy themselves that they can induce the restraint needed by American allies so that we won't be able to get there. And that if we still choose to come, then they can impose additional risk and costs on us. In other words, they've thought about how to manage escalation uh, and to induce our restraint and our de-escalation by their threats and acts. Uh, and I, I invoke an old Cold War term, theory of victory. Uh, there was a debate in the 1970s and 80s. Some of you historians of nuclear history will recall that Harold Brown said uh, famously, uh, we build, they build, we stop, they build. What, what explains this? Why, why were the Soviets building, building, building? Could they possibly believe that they could fight and win a nuclear war? Or that they could fight and win a big conventional war in Europe because of the nuclear shadow? Did they have a theory of victory? And if they had a theory of victory, should we have a theory of victory? We didn't really have one. Uh, should we have one? And this debate percolated on and then just died when the Cold War ended. Uh, I think that these leaders of these states have a theory of victory. Uh, in two senses, Clausewitz and Sun Tzu. Uh, you know, Clausewitz, if your vision of war is that it's a continuation of politics by other means, what, is, what then is your definition of victory? It's not when you've vanquished your enemy on the battlefield, it's when you've brought your enemy to a point where he chooses to capitulate because the risks and costs of continued refusal to accept the political outcome preferred that you prefer uh, are too high. Uh, and Sun Tzu, the, the spirit there is obvious. I, wouldn't, I don't at all believe that Russia, China, and North Korea want to fight and win a nuclear war. Uh, I don't at all believe they want to fight and win a conventional war against the United States. They want to win in the spirit of Sun Tzu. They want to break the regional security order that we're protecting. This is a theory of victory based on blackmail, brinksman, brinksmanship, and coercion. It's not about nuclear war fighting, except maybe in the case of Russia. Don't know. That's ambiguous. So all of this, so if, if they have a theory of victory, what's our theory of victory? Well, 
it's pretty much in the spirit of Sun Tzu. We hope they just don't ever go there. Uh, and this is a big hope. Uh, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's, the White House isn't very confident that we can just depend on our national military strength and go unchallenged by Kim Jong-un or Mr. Putin. I think there's a, a high worry and the risk of miscalculation uh, by one of these leaders that they think they've got a winning strategy and the time to play the strategy is now um, because sooner or later we'll get our act together uh, and um, thus we are in risky times. So, yep, I'm on my last page. Thank you. I was aiming for 45 minutes. So, um, uh, so, this tells me what I think the role of nuclear weapons are in our strategy. Uh, in our, our theory of victory, I don't, I don't, we haven't really written down our theory of victory, because we don't think of nuclear weapons in this way anymore. Uh, and, but I would say it's not a theory of nuclear war fighting, it's a theory of standing up. I, I've always liked it, the, when you ask the Chinese what's their nuclear strategy, it's counter deterrence. What does that mean? Uh, well, they expect us to deter them, and that's a bad thing from their eyes, and so they want to counter that strategy so they can do the right thing. This is the right framework for us to think about this problem. These three countries are trying to deter us and in conflict to prevent us from out-escalating them, inducing our restraint. We, need, we don't need to dominate them. We don't need to... Uh, defeat them militarily. We need to puncture the political effect of their coercion and blackmail strategies. Uh, and this, I think, is a problem that's not first and foremost a hardware problem. You don't say, well, I need exactly this many nuclear weapons of this type to solve this problem. But our nuclear weapons, like their nuclear weapons, cast a shadow over our expectations of conflict. Uh, they make the risk of war much more difficult to calculate. You can sort of estimate what your costs are in a war against the United States, but the, the risks, this is an important function of nuclear weapons in our posture. Uh, I think secondly, nuclear weapons have a, a very equally important assurance role today. Uh, the shortest pathway to a large proliferation of nuclear weapons would be the loss of confidence among U.S. allies in the U.S. nuclear weapons <coughs> to them. Um, um, and an additional argument I make in the book is about the assurance value of nuclear weapons to the United States. The American public doesn't love nuclear weapons, although, you know, the public polling indicates uh, a high degree of commitment to maintaining some nuclear deterrent capability. <coughs> but fundamentally, we as Americans are ambivalent about nuclear weapons, right? I mean, why, why wouldn't we be? Um, as are our allies. But uh, <coughs> let's recognize one side of that two-sided coin. This sort of uh, uh, uniquely potent tool is what assures us that we can do all of those things that our national strategy, that our vision of ourselves leads us to, go, to, to do. That the risks, we, we think that the risks of, being, of playing the role we've chosen to play are manageable, and I think part of that has to do with our nuclear deterrent. The last part of the book is an epilogue. It's a, it's a look ahead to the, uh, the next nuclear posture review, or whatever it might be called, in a new administration. And I think there are three fundamental questions. Is that balanced approach still right? And there's a, there's, there, there are those who would say, no, look, the arms control thing has played itself out, and the non-proliferation game is a losing game over time. So we don't need that balance anymore. We're going to have that debate next year. Um, second second high-level question, okay, is that view of the political tools right? Is there any more bang for the buck in arms control and non-proliferation? It's going to be hard to make a case for a pathway forward on arms control once a new start expires in 2021. 
Uh, and where do we go on military means? The third question. Um, the Bush administration was after new nuclear weapons for new military purposes. The Obama administration took the advice of the Congress and the Strategic Posture Commission and just said, do life extension programs. Don't change anything. Just keep them, modernize them so that they don't rust away. We're going to have that debate again, too. Uh, so three pretty big high-level questions, I think, will be at play next year. So with that, let me hope I've provoked. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to the comments and questions.